Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We have a special guest to the podcast this week. Um, this is Jackie. She is going to share her story with us, and I am really, really excited to hear her story. So I will pass it off to her to um, introduce yourself, tell a little bit about yourself. Hi. Yes. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, I'm excited to share my story. Um, as I mentioned, I am 59 years old, which means I was not diagnosed at birth, not even close. I was not diagnosed until I was 14, which kind of presents its own issues, pros and cons. Yeah, I, I could imagine that would be much more of a shock at that age. Yes, it was. And I think the biggest shock and the hardest thing to deal with at that age, because, you know, at that age, we're really starting to think about what is our life as an adult going to look like? Mm -hmm. I mean, as a child, we had already kind of started planning that in our minds. Yeah. And of course, a part of that for me was being a mom. Well, being told as classic Turner's 45XO, that's not in my future. That's not possible. I am completely infertile. Mm. So that was the hardest part to deal with. Yeah. yeah and the then the utility is that is 45XO, so I don't have that 46. So what, what am I? Mm. right I was raised of course as a as a female mm -hmm. I was definitely a girly girl mm -hmm. and so that was not going to change due to my diagnosis that was just who I am mm -hmm. yeah so when you got diagnosed I am very curious what things red flagged for you and what was that process like? Well, it was interesting because uh, my mom started taking me to my doctor, my primary physician, pediatrician, when I was about 11 years old. And he said, oh, she's just small, blah, blah, blah. There's really nothing going on. He even did a buckle smear, and for whatever reason, uh, it, can't, it did not come back with the diagnosis of classic Turner's. Oh, wow. It might have been a lab failure. Who, who knows? Yeah. So uh, at 14, I'm like, okay, I am not starting developing. I've not started my period. There is something wrong. So I um, pestered my mom into taking me back to a new doctor. We had switched to Kaiser in Santa Clara. And so we went to my, my, our primary care physician. And he's like, I think I know what this is. But let me bring someone else in. So he brings in, I don't know what this doctor was. He might have been an endocrinologist. But he, he, he came along with a bunch of residents in training and he didn't even walk through the doorway. I vividly remember him just standing in the doorway saying, I know what this is. Wow. Just by looking at me. Wow. He's like, I suspect this is Turner syndrome. Let's get you tested. And sure enough, the diagnosis came back, classic Turner's, and my primary doctor would not let me leave the hospital without having an uh, echocardiogram because he detected a murmur. Okay, well, that is good that they caught that in. Yes, it was the coarctation of the aorta. Mm -hmm. And he says, okay, let's, monitor this, let's keep an eye on this as you get older. So we did. 
So for you, what did they suggest moving forward for the puberty aspect of things and the hormone aspect of things? Yes. He prescribed immediately hormone replacement therapy. Okay. The, the two pill form. Okay. And so I did that. And then things started pro to progress as it should have. Started and to develop and my period and all of that. So did you shift what that looked like at all very much or have had that been, was that something that when you were on it, it was pretty much the same thing? Because I know there's so many different options right. now, but even since I first started, there's been so many options added. Yes. No, I was on that regimen all the way through. Okay. And do you have regular... I mean, more than no. At fifty nine, at fifty nine, um, yeah. No, I stopped taking hormone replacement when my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. Okay. So I talked to my doctor and said, "My mom was just diagnosed with breast cancer. I think I need to stop taking this." And she agreed with me, and so. And then, of course, I started getting regular mammograms. I was. Um, early 40s at that point. Okay. Was it a hard transition for you? Going no, actually. No. You mean like menopause, those things? Yeah. No. It was a non, non-issue. Really, I had no, <laughs> I did not have the classic symptoms. I mean, I, I run warm as it is. So, yeah, I didn't have the, the horrendous hot flashes or anything like that. But again, my periods were basically a non-issue. Mm -hmm. I didn't have cramping or any bad symptoms from that either. So I was very fortunate that, yeah, that was an easy transition. That's great. You know, I've always, I've been curious what that will be like for me because I know I've just, if I get off of my hormone regimen, I can very easily throw myself into starting that. And um, it seems for me, at least my hormones naturally are at a level that it, it goes down so quickly if I'm not on my regimen that it's like it flashes through it and then I'm there. I'm oh. Like, okay. Wow. So I've, I've been curious what that would be like, that it didn't, it wouldn't take very long. Right. But, um, and again, as we know, each person is different in how they oh, experience yeah. which, which symptoms they, they get or don't get. Yeah. So what was the test that officially diagnosed you with classic? Well, it was a buccal smear again. Okay. So they scraped inside the cheek and then did the chromosome count. Okay. So have you ever had a karyotype done with blood? No, no. Okay. That's interesting. Because I have the buccals, yeah, that just showed 45 XO so I guess they figured yeah. that's it yeah um yeah I've never had that one done before yeah I had it done twice like I said first time was negative the second time was uh-huh yes no question so what would you say in your life has been the biggest either struggle from Turner's or the biggest way that Turner's has impacted your life? Well, I, I go back to during my teen years, just struggling to identify who am I? Mm. You know, I mean, I, I can't have kids. What am I supposed to do? Yeah. If that's not 
going to be in my future? What is it going to be then? That yeah. was that was that was that same day, and that was that was the hardest. Have you? Did you end up going through any of the fertility testing at all to confirm what was happening? Uh, no, but I did consult with uh, my my gynecologist, and he checked and said, "Yeah, there's no way you would be able to carry anywhere near full term." I would recommend against anything like that. So my ex-husband and I went the adoption route. Okay. And yeah, and so we, we did adopt our son from birth. Very nice. Did you adopt through a private agency or through foster care? Through a private attorney. Okay, through very agency, cool. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. And um, is there anything that you have felt like you haven't seen enough information out there about just as you've watched research happening, new information coming out? I don't know. It feels almost like if you're over 50, there's nothing really left to, to say about it. Hmm. Kind of once, once you're not on hormones anymore. Exactly. Do you still get regular heart checkups? Oh, yes. I just had a echo a few months ago and it was good. Oh, good. Yeah. So yeah. I'm maintaining. Oh, and when I was 24, I developed some concerning symptoms in my legs. And I went back to my primary care physician and he, he said, Ooh, let me check your pulse in your ankles. And he's like, there's very little to almost no pulse. You are, yeah, you've got a problem going on here. He immediately scheduled an appointment with a cardiac surgeon at Kaiser in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I went up to, to San Francisco and the surgeon scheduled me for an angiogram. Okay. So I went and had the angiogram up there. And they said, oh, yeah, this is a big problem. We need to operate soon. So within a month, I was getting that coarctation repaired oh, wow. at Kaiser in San Francisco. Yeah. How was the recovery from that? Actually, the recovery was really easy. I was only 24, so, you know, it's going to be fairly easy to recover at that age. I mean, within five weeks, I was back at work. Okay. Very, very interesting. I, I've had so many echoes throughout my life. I've had, at this point, I think two or three cardiac MRIs. And neither of them are fun, but just the more stories I hear, the more it's worth making sure. Oh, it's very, very important. If you have any heart issues related to Turner's, that it's kept up on. That you have it monitored regularly, as frequently as you can. And also listen to your body, like I did. I told my doctor, I'm having a hard time walking up the stairs to my apartment. This is new. This is not normal for me. And that's what tipped him off. Yeah. Wow. So what would you say would be your biggest tip or guidance that you would give somebody that is a young, just finding out they have Turner's butterfly? Right. Um, again, be aware of what health issues there are related because they are not always there from birth, as you know. Mm -hmm. They can come up later. In my early 30s is when I developed hypothyroidism. So I've had to deal with that since 
my early, my mid thirties. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you got to listen to your body and just be aware of these that can happen later. Yeah. It's a, it's a big balance to try to find between making sure you're aware and not letting it overwhelm you. No, no. Like with my thyroid, I developed the symptoms and I told myself, I know what this is. This is my thyroid. Mm -hmm. And so I went to my doctor and said, this is what I'm experiencing. I think it's my thyroid. Can we have that checked? And she said, yep, yeah, you are probably right there. So it was an easy blood test and it confirmed that it was like off the charts. <laughs> Mm. It was in the 90s. Okay. What resources did you have when you were first being diagnosed as far as information on how to even understand Turner syndrome and how it might affect you? Again, this was back in the mid-70s, so very, very little. My doctor may have given me just like a little pamphlet, but very little in the way of resources. Was there any support groups or community happening? Not that I was aware of. I didn't know about the National Association until mid nineties. And then we had a local, we had a local support group in the San Francisco Bay area that I was a part of again in the mid nineties. But it wasn't until then that I was aware of anything like that mm. or where to go for more information. Yeah, you didn't have the internet. as No, that was pre-internet. Yeah, and even when I was, well, when my mom and dad got the diagnosis, I don't remember that part, but <laughs> um, right the internet was kind of, it wasn't fully a thing yet. And a lot of what was out there was scary. Yeah. Well, as you know, part of what they tell you is learning disabilities and blah, blah, blah. And I, and that, I didn't want to be labeled with that. Mm. And I knew, and I do know what I'm capable of, especially when challenged. So I, oh, that lay, that part of it really bothered me. Did you find it more harmful than helpful to know all of the different things that were potentials in those areas? Like, you know, not the physical health complications, but the emotional or social or learning complications that could come up? I think the only one that was kind of harmful to my self-esteem was the learning disabilities, the, the, the learning challenges possibly associated. Because as you know, it's a spectrum. Yeah. Not everybody is impacted with the same symptoms at the same degree even classics. Yeah, definitely. Um, did you encounter any of those struggles? No, because I kept my diagnosis pretty much to myself. I only shared it with family and just a few friends. And I still don't share it a whole lot. And I think that's for that reason. I don't want to be labeled. Yeah. That yeah. Makes sense. I totally agree with that part of it. Um, it is easy, and I catch myself doing it, to know that something can, can possibly, potentially be a part of it and automatically see a little sign of something go, oh, that's what it is. Right. And for me, that's a bit of a complicated mess because I have so many things that I very much struggle with from Turner's that could also be 
contributed from my family medical history. So I have like dual things going on that could play into that. So it's always oh, sure. would I have had that anyways or not. Um, but I also went through all the way through high school, um, not, and even a little bit of college, not sharing with very many people. I didn't, I had like two or three friends I talked to about it outside of yep. my family. Yep, exactly. Um, I always ran into not being totally certain how to best explain it to help somebody understand. What have you found that's worked to help those people that you do talk about it with understand your experience? Hmm. Again, I have not shared it with anybody in so many years. I think the last person I actually shared it with was my ex-husband. And that was very early into our relationship when he indicated he was very serious. And I'm like, oh, I think I better uh, let him know <laughs> sooner rather than later. And so I started from the inside out. I started with the infertility part of it. And then I worked my way out to the cause of the infertility, the term truce. Hmm. And then everything that surrounded that. Yeah. Yeah, that's usually, especially for me, because that's the biggest way I am impacted physically. Um, I mean, I do have a couple of other things, but nothing as intense, nothing as to that level. Um, that's just a doozy of a, <laughs> of, a yeah. of a struggle though. Um, I tend to start with that too. It's, it's something that when you talk just infertility, people can understand, but then when you go into, oh, but it's caused by this and you know, this isn't the usual just infertility circumstance. Well, and again, cause is a tricky word, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We know what it is. It's the absence or partial absence of that 46 chromosome. Mm -hmm. But what caused that 46 chromosome to be missing or uh, impacted, we don't know why, right? We don't know that cause. So I struggle with that word. Now that that's probably the other thing. It's like, I always wanted to know why, why? Yeah, that's hard. It's a hard thing, especially with how emotional some of the ways it impacts you can be. There's so many emotions tied to so much of it. Um, even even something as simple as the math struggles, because I very much struggle with math. Um, I have my entire life, and it was always something that has been an emotional thing for me too, because it's oh, so yeah. hard. Yeah. So hard just thinking I I want to, and in my head, I can feel like I understand it, and then I go to try to do it, and it just doesn't yes, it's work. Gone. It's gone. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, I always make the joke, it might as well be this foreign language for us I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what helped me there? Because I also struggled with math. Mm -hmm. With being challenged. Oh, yeah. Because I'll tell you a funny story. I was in sixth grade. And my math teacher, I was struggling. She was not a very nice or a good teacher, especially for the girls. Mm. She, she was one of those that favored the boys, especially in the STEM subjects. Mm. And she pulled me aside after class and said, Jackie, you will never be a bookkeeper. And I'm thinking, I'm in sixth grade. I'm like, bookkeeping? What is having to, what, what is being a librarian have to do with math? <laughs> I was, I was, she made no sense to me. So I went home and told my mom and she's like, okay, a bookkeeper 
is someone that manages the financial accounting of companies and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I'll show her. And my first job, my senior year of high school, was as a bookkeeper. Oh, that's awesome. My major was, my first major, I should say, was accounting. That's awesome. So again, I'm the type, if you challenge me and say, you can't do that, I'm going to show you. Oh, yeah. I definitely, <laughs> definitely relate to that. I have some of that, too. And it helps to have that push or that accountability around you in that way. You know, especially when it can be so easy to fall back on, well, I just, you know, like. Or use it as an excuse. Well, I'm just not good, so I'm not going to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My mom was very good about, she would, she would always, as I got older, I became a little more independent with being able to make sure I was on top of what I needed to, to meet the needs of my classes for math. But she always would check in and she'd say, are you, are you getting the help you need? Are you actually understanding it? Or are you just trying to get by? You need to, right. you know, she would be on top of me about that. Like, if you need to get help, you need to not wait to get help. Yeah. And, you know, she never let me fall back on, well, I just, I'm just not good at it. Yeah. My mom was the same way, fortunately. Keep trying. She didn't <laughs> let me slack off or use it as a, an excuse or a crutch. Yeah. Yeah. And she, I remember some of the conversations we've had, she specifically said, um, you know, I, I was diagnosed in utero. So my parents knew before I was even born, but I ended up being told when I was nine and a half ish. Um, and a lot of what she's told me for the decision she made then for, you know, things she would put me in for activities or things like that was she was very protective and she didn't want anyone to make me feel like I couldn't do anything or nitpick me about anything and put any doubt in my head. So she was very much protecting my sense of, no, I'm capable of anything. Right. Yeah, my mom was the same way. She wasn't protective. She was, you can do it. Mm -hmm. And her favorite phrase, especially when it came to education, apply yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't do the bare minimum. Really work at it. Yeah. And yeah. I think that that was very helpful to meet those challenging areas. Yeah. It's, it's a great push, <laughs> especially if you it have is. a personality that has that challenge to it. That Oh, I wonder if a lot of us have that. You know, I had a conversation with Anish last week. That was an awesome conversation. And um, she kind of said the same thing. She got diagnosed in March, she got diagnosed just this year. And she said, you know, just in being in the communities for that long, she said, we are strong, we are fighters. And, yes. oh, you know, yeah. I feel like, I feel like that's something that these experiences probably play a part. And, you know, they kind of teach you how to push. Well, we have, we are fighters from before birth, mm -hmm. right? We fought to even be born. Yes. Yeah. So it's just who we are. Yeah. So I am also curious about, I know you mentioned that when you first got diagnosed and, you know, it was at an age where you were struggling with, you know, you were starting, supposed to be starting puberty. So that, you know, added to the struggle of what is going on. Right. Um, and you kind of, when you got the diagnosis, had a moment of, what does that make me? Right. How did you process through that? Do you have any advice for other girls? Because I know this is, I think we all have that moment. Yes. Well, I think, I think it's for, it's the same for anyone at that age. 
struggling to find their identity, whether it be sexual identity or their gender identity. It, it's like that for a lot of people. At the, I don't think it's unique to Turner's. I think it's just kind of more in our face. Mm -hmm. But I just, I look back and I say, okay, so what am I missing mm -hmm. as a woman? Ovaries. Okay, no big. I got everything else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And there are a lot of women not Turners, or at least not that I've heard, um, that, you know, they have to have hysterectomies really young. Yes. And that, you know, that doesn't make them any less of a woman. No, exactly. So that's, that's how I kind of put it into perspective is, okay, what is it that I'm missing that makes society identify a female, right? Mm -hmm. Besides, of course, the outward signs, but yeah. internally, what is it that I'm missing? It's just the one thing. Yeah. Did you ever struggle with having to be on hormones? Was that ever something that was bothersome for you? Uh, remembering. I am really <laughs> bad about taking my medication regularly as I should. Mm -hmm. So that was the biggest struggle. But I think, and that was only as I got older. Mm -hmm. As a kid, I was like on top of it because I'm like, yeah, I want this. This is important. Mm -hmm. So I was very good. I had a calendar and blah, blah, blah. And made sure I was on top of it. But, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's a pretty common thing is trying to remember it because it's every day. It's not. Yes. It's not something that you usually would be thinking of doing. So. Well, you get up in the morning and you go about getting ready. And I don't know for you, but for me, that's the first thing that kind of goes out of my mind. I'm focused on showering, brushing my teeth, getting dressed, getting ready to get out the door kind of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of thinking about, okay, what do I need to do today? And going right. through that. Exactly. Or I have usually throughout my life planned taking them at night just because I'm much more of a night owl than a morning person. So I uh -huh. always felt like I'd have more success then. But by the time I get into bed and I'm tired. Yeah. I'm just, mm. Well, and some medications you have to take in the morning, like the thyroid medication. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting interesting yeah. experience being on medication so young yes and as i get older my goal is to be on as few as possible mm -hmm. right now it's just my thyroid medication but i'd like to try and keep it that way yeah that's good yeah do you take any um special or specific supplements with that no. I was actually just going to, um, as we wrapped up, see if there was anything you would want to add or make sure people knew um, as we finish up. Yes. I think it's important that we take advantage of all the resources now available on Turner's, such as the, the Turner Syndrome Society of the United States, and the local chapters and yeah. the annual conferences. Yes. And there is so much more local than I ever realized. And it is amazing. All of the lists on their website, on the Turner Center Society website, yes. all of that linked and listed. And it's amazing how many local chapters there are. Absolutely. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for talking with me and sharing your story. Well, thank you for having me on. Yeah. It was lovely getting to talk to you and get to hear your story. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.